Hello, I'm Paul Bradshaw. And I'm Lauren Gray. Welcome to Viral History, your weekly fix of all things history. Coming up on this week's show, I get the lowdown on the latest findings from Must Farm, the Bronze Age Pompeii. And we take another grisly visit to the surgeon's room. But first up, let's go to the news. Members of the DNA team who determined the identity of Richard III's remains are now helping to identify one of Jack the Ripper's victims. Dr. Turi King and other researchers from the University of Leicester are involved in a new project to identify the Ripper's last victim, Mary Jane Kelly. Computer scientists and historians from the University of St Andrews have created a 3D model of what Edinburgh looked like in the 16th century. The digital reconstruction is based on a drawing made by an English military engineer before much of the city was destroyed by the English in 1544. And manuscripts including a recipe book compiled by the master chef of Richard II in the 14th century are to be photographed and shared on the internet for the first time. One of the recipes describes the medieval way to cook a porpoise. Hi, I'm Dr Emma Wells and you're watching Viral History. Next up, the Must Farm settlement was discovered in 1999 and has gone on to revolutionise our understanding of life in the late Bronze Age Britain. Yes, this incredibly well-preserved site has been hailed as the British Pompeii and we recently sat down with some of the archaeologists involved to learn about the latest discoveries. Sharing the minutiae of Bronze Age life with modern-day Britons. Archaeologists who worked on this miraculous site were on hand at this event at Chatteris Church in Cambridgeshire to provide expert insights. I think what really makes Must Farm such an absolutely phenomenal settlement and piece of Bronze Age archaeology is, is the insight that that's giving us into the day-to-day -day life of people 3,000 years ago, not just in the Fens but, but in, in the UK as well. And it's being able to kind of unpick away those kind of layers of, of prehistory and archaeology and get individual moments that happened in the, the lifespan of that settlement. So people having a bucket full of old metalwork ready to be recycled or the very meal that they were eating at the time the settlement was destroyed. It's, it's moments like that that you, you just dream of as an archaeologist. Must Farm is an archaeological site of international significance. And now, with the excavation finished last summer, the task of analysing the archaeology has begun in earnest. It's that kind of totality of, of lifestyle that we're getting. We're getting the clothes that the people are wearing, we're getting the food that they're eating, the objects that they're making in terms of pottery, in terms of metalwork. We're getting such an amazing insight into, into the houses of the people who are there. We're looking inside a Bronze Age roundhouse. So we know for the first time ever what activities are going on in different areas of the building. We're seeing cooking areas, um, textile areas, areas where they're probably hanging and smoking meat. And it's, it's that degree of, of clarity that's something that people normally only theorise about happening, especially in the Bronze Age. One winter, a thousand years before the Romans invaded, a group of Bronze Age Britons built houses on stilts on a tributary in Cambridgeshire. A mere six months later, the settlement was mysteriously abandoned, leaving behind a remarkably intact time capsule preserved by the silt for 3,000 years. There was this preconception from a lot of the people we spoke to at the beginning of this project that, you know, 3,000 years ago in the fence, people were going to be struggling to survive and, you know, they were scrabbling every minute for, for food and resources. But the picture we're getting here is a group of, you know, very well equipped, very learned people. They're people who are very much in touch with their environment, they're very much in touch with their, their the kind of construction processes for their buildings, um, the, the resources, the tool, you know, absolutely everything is has a sense of, of completeness and they're finding the time to kind of do decoration on objects. You know, they, they seem to have some kind of leisure time and it's not this kind of sort of almost stereotypical image of prehistoric people just struggling. And I, and I think that that's something that's, that's really important to get across from this. And, and there's kind of a, a tendency to view people as being uncultured and unintelligent before the Roman period and that they were all barbarians, but that's just completely not true because you know, you know, hundreds of years before the Iron Age and the barbarian reports from the Romans, we're, we're seeing really sophisticated society. The analysis of the finds will continue for years to come with the promise of a much greater understanding of Bronze Age Britain.
An endless stream of artefacts from Must Farm. <laughs> Next up on Viral History, Haley Considine once again takes us by our trembling hands and leads us back to the 16th century as we make another visit to the surgeon's room. Hello everybody and welcome back to the surgeon's room where of course we are with the surgeon, Kevin Goodman, and I believe today that we're going to be talking about bleeding, Kevin. For 2,000 years. Uh, it was believed that everyone was made up of the full humours. Blood, phlegm, yellow bile and black bile. If your humours were in balance, it meant you were healthy. If you had too much of a humour or not enough, it meant you were unhealthy. Basically, you're in a state of dis-ease. Ah. And if you put dis and ease together, you get disease. So, the point of treatment was very much balancing the humours out. If you had too much blood, then it's not just about, oh look, let's get in there and start bleeding. A change of diet may be required. Take more exercise. Very, very modern approach. But if that didn't work, then we would get to physical methods of bleeding. Now, if you're feeling a bit unwell and there's a bit too much blood in there, so what we'll do, we'll do a bit of general bleeding, known as venesection opening the vein. So, what we'll do is, we'll get someone to grasp a pole. By grasping the pole, it would allow the veins to pop out. So similar, similar to today, when we yeah. wrap something around the arm to very bring much, the vein out. Very much, mm. I could then get one of my fleams, or a thumb lancet. That allows me to perforate the vein and under it I'd have a bleeding bowl just to catch the blood. Once I've taken out the amount of blood that I consider to be helpful then we might get a cauterizing guy in, heat it up, place it in the wound just to stop it bleeding. So let me get this straight, this is all guesswork really then, so it's just based on what you judge to be the yeah, right amount of blood. Yeah, but that also depends on the, the time of the year, the state of the patient, what, uh, where the planets are according to the, uh, you know, the zodiac. So it's very, very much a science, but it's their science, right. not ours. <laughs> so once you've drawn off that amount of blood, then that's it, you're good to go. But that's a general bleeding. But in some cases, you might have uh, a specific illness and that requires specific bleeding. The first method of specific bleeding is probably somebody today has heard of. Cupping. Yeah. Now, people today, they're familiar with cupping because what they do, you heat the cup up, you place it part of the body. As it cools, a vacuum is created and basically draws up some flesh. I believe it's an alternative therapy now. It is, it, it mm -hmm. is. That's dry cupping. We're not doing dry cupping. We are doing wet cupping. Okay. So I will remove the cup and that lump I've created. I'll get my thumb lancet, perforate the lump, heat up the cup once more, place it on and as it cools, more blood is drawn out. Wet cupping. Right. Now, the other kind of specific bleeding. Here we go. Here's the boy. <laughs> the important thing, however, with leeches is it's what's in their saliva. Now, in their saliva is something known as herodin, and it's an anticoagulant. And it's possibly the most powerful anticoagulant in nature. So when the leech bites you, into your bloodstream goes the anticoagulant, which allows the leech to carry on feeding. Now we've all seen the films where people come out the swamp, think 
Oscars, stand by me, African Queen, and they start burning leeches off, knocking them off. You don't actually do that with a leech. If you disturb the leech while it's feeding, it regurgitates its last meal back into your body, which runs the risk of infection. Mm. All you must do is let the leech feed and drop off. If you, somebody has to have a, something sewn back on, an arm, leg, uh, while surgeons can reconnect veins and arteries, we really cannot reconnect capillaries. By putting the leech on, the capillaries can be connected. So they really are useful. And the next generation of blood thinners will be coming from leech saliva, rodent. Wow, that's fantastic. So we've been using those for centuries and yeah. potentially we're going to continue to use them Indeed in the coming centuries as well. Indeed. Thank you again, Kevin, for that wonderful chat that we've had again today. And next week we will be looking at a, another bodily fluid. Can you guess which one it is? Well, there's a little clue behind me on that chart there. It's not a Dulux colour chart and we'll explain all next week. Have a lovely day. Ah, the multi-purpose leech. <laughs> Cured most conditions. Next up, it's on this day. Thirtieth of March, Beau Brummel, British dandy and saviour of British sartorial elegance, died today in 1840 in a lunatic asylum for the poor, having been exiled to France. Well, that's about it from us for this week. Feel free to hit the subscribe button, follow Viral History on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram, like this video and tune in next week. And remember, what's past is prologue. See you in seven days. Nice. No emphasis that time. Am I, am I decent? Yes. I'll just go with it. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thunderbar. <laughs> that was great. <laughs>